Um, my name is Kennedy Smith. I am a second year pharmacy student. I went to the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff for undergrad, where I got a bachelor's in chemistry. Um, and I'm either going to do clinical or ownership or both. You're muted. Thank you. I thought I clicked it. Um, uh, my name is Olga Rodriguez. I went to undergrad at UALR where I got my degree in chemistry and biology. And I'm currently a P2. And I guess like a little fun fact about me is I played piano for seven years. I think Paloma is going to join a little bit later. Okay, thank you all for introducing yourself. And we will start this event by having the medical students start their presentation. And then we would have the pharmacy students um, present. But the medical students are starting their presentation. So um, let's all be quiet and make sure we, are, we have our computers on mute and um, pay attention to the presentation. Thank you. Over to the medical students. Um, I am trying to share my screen now. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, again, I'm Karime Boulevard. Uh, and I am the president of LMSA, the Latino Medical Student Association at UAMS. Uh, we're an association dedicated to really helping um, Latinx medical students um, thrive in medical school, getting them connected to mentorship, community, and outreach events, and really getting them prepared for residency. Uh, and we also seek to do a lot of community events within the Hispanic population around Little Rock. And hello again, my name is Quincy Gregg. Like I said, I'm a second year med student and I'm also the president of the Student National Medical Association, SNMA. And we're basically an uh, organization aimed at advocating for underrepresented and minority medical and pre-medical students, as well as members of our community. And like LMSA, um, we do a lot of volunteer events, a lot of pipeline programs. We have different conferences and we really aim at kind of exposing pre-med and med students to different career paths and just advocating for people in our community, you know, uplifting those around us and serving. And I'm beginning, I'm gonna begin, begin the presentation. So first off, we just wanna talk about what a doctor is and for me, the idea of what a doctor is has really changed since I was in y'all's shoes as a high schooler to now as a medical student. I remember in high school, I really thought a doctor was just kind of like uh, a genius, an individual who just came in the room, uh, prescribed medicine, looked down your throat, maybe give you a shot every once in a while and just walked out. And it was just real big disconnect to who I thought a doctor was. And mainly that was because I only interacted with doctors when I went to the doctor's office. And I didn't actually get to meet and know my first doctor or physician until I got to college. So I really just didn't associate them with being a, a human being, I guess. I thought they were just geniuses who uh, heal people. But now that I'm in med school, my second year of med school and closer to becoming a doctor, my actual self, I realized that literally there are people just like you and me. You don't have to be a genius to get into med school. If anything, I think hard work is the, the biggest attribute you need to have. And I just feel like everybody should know that, especially if you don't have any doctors in your family, you didn't grow up being around doctors on a personal level. But on a basic level, a doctor or physician or somebody who's qualified to treat six people, and we use our medical knowledge that we attain through medical school, residency, fellowship, and it's a vast array of different specialties, which we'll talk about later. 
also, why do I want to be a doctor? Um, if you don't know, if you don't know if you want to be a doctor, or if you do know, this is a question you got to think about a lot. And this doesn't just apply to physicians, apply to pharmacy. You want to be a nurse practitioner, any sort of doctor. You need to think about this. Like, what is your reason? What is your driving force? And for now, it's just to make sure you're doing what you actually like to do, your passion. But for later on, this is going to be a good question you need to answer when you're filling out applications, going through interviews, and just, you know, having that ambition, that motivation to get you through those long, rough nights when you're up late at night, you know, still scratching your head, do I really need to do this? And for me, I think I just discovered I really wanted to be a doctor in undergrad. I know some people know since they're in high school, some people have family members who inspire them, but I had kind of more of a gradual process. During undergrad, I was an undecided major. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I actually went to college just to play football, but I really discovered I like science classes. I always knew I like to learn, and I'm a people person. I like being around people. I like meeting people. I like interacting with people, so I knew I wanted to help people, and these questions on here, like, I want to help people. I like science. I want to have a financially secure job. I think these are reasons most people think they want to be doctors initially. But honestly, I think everybody needs to find a deeper reason than that, especially when you get down farther down the low road and you have to answer this question. You need something that's, you know, more personal to you. Do you have a family member who inspires you? Um, did you have a, a unique experience at an internship where you really got the shadow and really got the help? Did you travel out of the country and help, I don't know, uh, with Doctors Beyond Borders or something like that, something unique. So I say this is a question you should often ask yourself. And even if you don't want to be a doctor, if you want to be an engineer, a lawyer, a nurse, ask yourself, why do you want to be these uh, these specific positions? Because a lot of times when you say you just want to help people, you come to the conclusion you can do that with a lot of other careers. If you just want to make a lot of money, you can do that with a lot of other careers. So really try to narrow down and figure out what you want to do, especially when you're in high school, you don't have that much to worry about. Try to figure out who you are, what career meshes with your personality, and what you can see yourself doing for a long period of your life. So I want to be a doctor. What do I need to do to get there? This is the big question. Um, you know, it's not just, it's not, it's not as simple as the same, but I'm just gonna lay out, I'm just gonna lay out the groundwork so you know, at least have a rough idea of what you need to be doing at each stage of life. So uh, this is a traditional track. You do four years of high school. This is where you are. You get your high school diploma. Then after high school, you should apply to college. You get into college. Um, you get your bachelor's degree. And then in medical school, you do four years and you get your medical degree. So I didn't notice initially, but until I, you know, got to college and stuff. But when you finish medical school, you are actually a doctor. It's like you're not specialized in anything. You're just a blank state doctor. And then after medical school, you apply to a residency, which can be three to seven years. And that's when you specialize in what type of doctor you want to be. So for, so after your four years of medical school, you're a doctor. And then you go to residency so you can train to become a specific pediatrician or a cardiologist or a neurologist. You, that's, the, that's, that's how that breaks down. But this is your traditional track. But I just want to emphasize everybody's journey is different. And so for me personally, after my four years of undergrad, I took a grad, I took a gap year. And even my four years of undergrad, I spent like four and a half years instead of four because I decided on my major late. That kind of laid my crack classes. But I wanted to do things my way. And so I think it's a big thing to emphasize that everybody's journey is different and not to compare yourself to others because you're going to get in college and you're going to talk to your advisors, talk to your friends, and you're going to feel like you need to do things a certain way, but that's totally not true. I have classmates who started med school in their 30s. I start, I have classmates who started med school after they started a family, uh, who already done one career, they're on to the next, who joined the military, got out of the military, and now decide they want to be a doctor. So it's, everybody's circumstances are a little bit different. So don't let your journey uh, just because it's not matched up to somebody else's, you know, make you feel like you shouldn't do it. So take the time you need. You have plenty of time. I know sometimes you feel like um, you have to have everything planned out exactly, cookie cutter way in order to do it, but that, that's, that's not true. So this is gonna be just like a breakdown into specific steps. And I feel like everybody here in high school is in the perfect position because everything's low stakes. 
everything's you're at the ground level. You get to build from here. And what you do is what you really need to do is just figure out what you want to do. But if you know you want to be a doctor and you want to lay a good foundation, I say go ahead and start taking classes that are relevant to being a doctor in the future. Take an anatomy class, take chemistry tests, take AP biology, physics, communication, take things that are going to help you get to the next level. And I say a big thing I feel like you should do is learn how to study now. I know in high school, a lot of times things come easy. You don't mind, you might not have to study. You might just have to study hard for one day before a test. But in college, you really have to build on those skills, especially when you get into med school. I think a lot of my classmates who have the biggest challenge adjusting to med school are those who didn't have to study, study as hard in college. And likewise for undergrad, the people who are gonna struggle the most in undergrad are the people who learn to study a little bit later. So go ahead and try to develop those skills, watch YouTube, they got great advice, great study tips, and just try to incorporate those into your transitioning phase. And so once you graduate high school, get your diploma in four years, uh, next you move on to college. And college, I say the big thing is to take your required courses. Believe it or not, if you want to go to medical school, you do not have to be a pre-med, a biology, or even a STEM major. You can have an English degree, you can have a business degree, but you need to take the required classes to the medical school you're applying to. So let's say I, I'm in college as a, as a student who know they want to go to med school. I need to look at UAMS website and see what classes are required for me to take in order for me to get accepted to UAMS. But I think this is cool because if you always want to be an art, art major or always want to be a band major or doing something else that's not exactly STEM related, you can still do that. But at the same time, just take your required courses and make sure you're on track to go to medical school. But at the end of your undergrad, towards the end, probably your junior year or senior year, whatever path you to take, decide to take, you need to go ahead and take your MCAT, which is your medical college admissions test. And it's long, it's a little expensive, but you can get through it. There's plenty of MCAT prep courses. I took one sponsored by UAMS and they really sit you down, give you study tips, get you advice, uh, even buy you workbooks, you take practice tests. And also with these prep courses, they help you fill out your actual med school application as well, which is good. They help you write your personal statement, just make yourself look good, make everything work out well. But also, undergrad, I will say this is a time you need to start shadowing physicians a little bit more. If you have time, do research. A lot of people do research. Take on leadership opportunities and just get involved on campus and show the med schools that you know, you're willing to be an involved individual in your community. You're able to multitask different things. And it just really shows that you're a go-getter ambitious. So after you taking your MCAT, apply to med school, get accepted, now you're actually in med school, which a lot of people say is the hardest part. And thus far, I will say getting to med school is probably a little bit harder than actually staying in med school, in my opinion, because, you know, that's just a whole stressful process. You're kind of begging people to let you in, but now you kind of get validated. You're like, okay, I, I do deserve to be here. And so while you're in med school, it's two years in the class room. That's called your preclinical years. So essentially you're still studying, you're taking tests, it's just like undergrad, kind of like high school in the small science classes. So you're just kind of learning uh, about different diseases, learning about cells, you're still learning about proteins. You're getting all the equipment you need, all the knowledge you need to actually treat people. And so your second two years, that's when you're actually learning how to do things. Those are years you're in the hospital and that's when you begin your rotations. And like I said, at the end of medical school, um, you're like a blank say, you don't really, you're not really decided on anything, but you got to sample all the different specialties during your rotations. So it's really to help you decide what do you want to do for the rest of your life. And so you might, you might uh, do a couple weeks in family medicine, a couple weeks in OB, OB gone surgery. And in between these years, you still have to take step tests, which are, which are essentially standardized board tests. And they just make sure you're on par, make sure you're obtaining information and, and retaining it a little bit so you can apply it in the, in the hospital. And so after your four years of medical school, that's when you apply for residency. So medical school, I'm, not, I'm a doctor, but in residency, I actually learned how to be a pediatrician. I actually learned how to do family medicine. And so you, you learn how to specialize a little bit more. And like I said, this could be three to seven years, and this is great. And while it's, while it's good, you're a doctor and all, you're still not getting paid doctor salary. I think you are on average, you get paid around $50,000. So you're still you're still earning more money than you were when you're a medical student, but you're, you're definitely not capped at all. 
and you still have to take board exam. You still have to kind of prove yourself and show that you're retaining information, you're learning knowledge. And honestly, after residency, you can be done, but you can specialize even a, a little bit even more. So after residency, I would be a pediatrician, but if I want to specialize even more, and let's say I want to specialize in hearts, I can um, be a I can go to a fellowship where I to become a pediatric cardiologist. So it's always a way to learn more, and get a little, little bit more knowledge. But after residency, finally, you're done. You made it. You're attending. You're getting paid actual doctor money, which you know everybody hear about, and you. All your hard work is paid off. You receive the fruits of your labor. And I know just going through all of this, you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot of time invested. I kind of would be out of school a little bit sooner. I want to start my career a little bit earlier. But please do, let, do not let time be an obstacle for you achieving your dream. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be spending your time doing something, whether it is already working, beginning your career, or working towards your, your, your dream career while going to school so don't let time be an obstacle because you're going to be spending that time doing anything so this is really an investment on yourself and at the end of the day you're going to have plenty of years to work ahead of you so all right so um thank you quincy for that wonderful run through i'm going to talk about the last half of our presentation and the first thing that I'm going to talk about are the types of doctorates that there are. So um, there are two types among the many that we have. I am sure some of you have heard of PhDs, which is um, someone that gets a doctorate in philosophy or in law, and um, they are usually professors. And then you have um, MD doctors, which are doctors of medicine, and you may have heard of DO doctors, which are doctors of osteopathic medicine. Um, the differences between these two is we both all study the same material and end up taking similar board exams, but DOs just have a little bit more training in something they call OMM, which is osteopathic manipulative treatment, which is they use different modalities, especially like moving the body in different ways to kind of help the um, patient there right then and there. However, all of the medical specialties, especially MDs and DOs, are moving towards a holistic approach towards medicine and treating the whole individual instead of just the symptoms. So we're slowly coming together. Um, there's also other types you can, um, without even like continuing on with your MD, you can even become a PhD or an MPH alongside your MD. And so a lot of people do this because, for example, if you do MD, PhD, um, you can get your med school and PhD years paid for so you don't have to take out any loans. And this is great for people that really want to continue to do a lot of research um, once they become doctors. And then your MPH is a master's of public health um, that really delves into finding out more about social inequity, social determinants of health, and kind of treating all of those disparities that um, need to be addressed in our current society. And a lot of people that do MD and PHs end up pursuing careers in public health departments and really trying to work within their community to improve the overall health of the community. However, you don't have to necessarily get these separate degrees to be able to practice in these regions. MDs can still do research as MDs. They don't need a PhD. Um, you can just go to like an academic center and do some more research. And MPH is, you don't need that necessarily. You can just work really closely with members of your community to really continue to improve your community. Okay. The next thing I'm going to talk about are the different medical specialties. Uh, some of you may have heard of your primary care physician or your family medicine physician. They're kind of the usual starting point for a lot of us. 
Um, and then there are specialists. So primary care physicians, they take care of many general things. Um, they can be anywhere from general surgery, emergency medicine, or family medicine, whereas a specialist tends to really, really centralize and study one specific thing really, really well. And so you can, for example, do general surgery residency, become a general surgeon and realize, hey, I want to specialize in the heart and do specifically heart surgery. And so then you can do a fellowship and specialize and become a cardiothoracic surgeon, and then you would be a specialist. And I know some of you guys may think like, oh, maybe I don't want to do medicine because I don't like blood, or I don't want to be necessarily in direct contact with sick people. And I just want to say that a lot of medicine has different, very different niches for everyone. And even if you don't like blood or you don't want to be in direct contact with patients, you can be a pathologist. And pathologists like they look inside a microscope and they're able to tell your family medicine doctor, your ob gyne and all these other specialties, hey, this person has cancer, consider treating with this. And they're very, very key um, players in medicine. They tell us a lot. And the other specialty that doesn't necessarily have a lot of patient encounter like physically is radiology. They read our x-rays, they read our CTs, our MRIs, and they're there telling the rest of us what is going on inside your body before we even cut you open or before we even see you. And so that they help so much behind the scenes. And so that's why medicine has a little bit of everything. Um, and the last thing that we wanted to touch on is that medical school, medical training, it's a long, hard road. And some days it's tough. Um, on the left-hand side is a picture of me after a 24-hour shift. I'm in the gray scrubs, the gray top. Um, and you can probably see how tired I was. Um, and it, it was a rough shift. It was trauma call. I got a, I saw a lot of people that were sick, a lot of people that were very, very badly injured. I didn't sleep at all for 24 hours. Um, I didn't even sit down for more than like five minutes during that entire night. Um, and then you see me in the bottom photo in the blue scrubs. And that was me after a three hour surgery. And Definitely more rested, definitely more energetic. I'm even wearing a nice hat. Um, and so every day doesn't have to be a bad day. You can have good days with the medicine and you can have some hard days. And the key is to find a balance. Um, and so on the right hand side, this is part of finding your balance. A lot of people in medicine, um, we go and hang out with our friends to kind of de-stress and kind of talk about things outside of medicine and become more well-rounded people. Um, in the middle, you see um, a lot of previous medical students that went out and did some paintings while sipping on some wine. And that was a way that they found to kind of de-stress and kind of um, get back in touch with who they were. And so all of this is to say that in pursuing a medical doctorate career, um, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You have to really focus on a making this a journey and becoming a super well-rounded individual, even starting early in high school and knowing, hey, these are hobbies that make me happy. These are things that make me happy. Volunteering and figuring out like, hey, I really enjoy volunteering at the food pantry. Like this makes me happy. This makes me feel like myself. And kind of knowing these things that make you happy every day or bring a little bit of joy into your life can help you a lot in times of stress. And so I want to address three big questions that you need to kind of ask yourself as you go into this journey and consider um, medicine. One is how do you manage stress? Um, for me personally, this was something that I've always struggled with. I thought that 
you know, maybe just like watching a movie on a Friday night and then going to sleep and getting a good night's rest. That was how I managed my stress. And it turned out that that wasn't it. Um, I ended up continuously hoarding all of this stress in my life and realizing that the appropriate way for me to manage my stress was a combination of things. It involved a lot of journaling and journaling my thoughts out and expressing my feelings, meeting up with people and talking with them, and maybe even combining a little bit of movement and just like getting outside or having a dance workout, doing some salsa and just getting all of these things that were hobbies and in pouring those into my life to bring a little bit of joy when I was feeling down really made a difference. The other thing is, how do you feel about missing big life events? Medicine can be a bit time consuming. And sometimes you're not able to ask for time off. Um, I've missed a lot of my friends' weddings. Um, I have a friend who hasn't been able to visit a very, very sick family member um, for many months because she has to continue doing a rotation where she's required to stay there. She may be able to visit them in December when she has a vacation, but she can't come up and see her family member who may pass away at any point. Um, so definitely consider it like life goes on and you are definitely imparting on a long journey, but you have to realize that there are compromises that you have to take and you have to make some sacrifices. The other thing that I wanna point out is that there may be some delay in some normal life events like having a baby or getting married. Some people do manage to have babies in college and maybe even a baby or two in medical school. And usually they have a lot of familial support. They have family that will take care of the child while they're on rotations and while they're studying because you're often studying for long periods of time and are not able to care for a child. Um, there are other people that realize that they don't have the support right now to do it. And so, especially in women right now, women physicians, there is currently a lot of research being done because we're seeing an increase in um, female infertility in physicians. And so that leads us to consider a lot of things like, should we be freezing our eggs? And so a lot of residencies often offer to their residents like, hey, we have good enough insurance that you can decide if you want to freeze your eggs. Um, and that is a decision that you have to make of like, hey, I'm going into surgery residency. It's going to be another five years before I can have a child. I may be ending surgery at 31, 32. Um, and then maybe as an attending, I can decide to have a child, but that kind of minimizes your window of having a baby. And then marriage, a lot of people can get married in college, they can get married in medical school, but marriage is also in and of itself expensive. And so planning a wedding can be really expensive and even moving your spouse to a different area. Because when you apply to residency, you're not guaranteed to stay in the same area that you stayed for medical school. You may have to move to a completely different uh, state. And that means that you're uprooting your spouse's life and make, forcing them to choose a different career, possibly. So a lot of considerations for medicine. But we hope that overall, you can take away the fact that in medicine, it's all about delayed gratification. Um, this is not an instant gratification journey. This is a career where you are investing in yourself continuously but you're also investing in your future in future generations. You are becoming a model citizen for the rest of your community, and you're going to be there to help people at the worst times of their life. Thank you so much um, for presenting that. I really gained a lot. I don't know for everybody else. And this is the moment to ask questions. If you have any questions that you wanted to ask them during the presentation, you can ask them now. And if you don't have any questions right now and one question pops up, like when the pharmacy students are 
presenting, you can ask them at the end of the pharmacy student's presentation. But now um, the ground is open for questions. So uh, I have a question. Um, what factors do you consider when considering a medical school? Like, what do you look for? Um, for me, it was about curriculum. I am a very hands-on learner, so I wanted a medical school that really promoted simulations, um, you get you got to learn procedures like really fast and early, got to get into patient care. There was a student run clinic so I could easily start practicing a lot of my physical exam. Um, and I also wanted to find a medical school that already had a lot of like volunteering opportunities. So. I know a lot of people um, also look at like, what is the middle school, school school doing to retain students and make sure students feel supported? Because like I like we kind of emphasize medical school can be stressful and it's a big phase of your life. So you kind of want to investigate like what is that middle school, school gonna do to ensure that I stay there and I'm in the right air space. I have a question. Um for both of you, what is the coolest like the coolest thing you've seen? during your experience, like during your um, time as a medical student? Um, I don't know uh, much about Quincy's experience because he's still um, in preclinical years, so he hasn't seen a lot of patients just yet. Um, but I think seeing your first twin C-section is always a blast. Um, I'm not specifically going into ob but it was definitely something that was very interesting to see. Um, and most surgeries, but specifically a kidney transplant, um, because you actually get to see the kidney kind of get blood flow into it and kind of revive itself after being frozen for a while. That is so cool. Yeah, I'm just going to let a career may have that one because <laughs> uh, I'm still looking at PowerPoints and those aren't very cool. Well, some of them are cool. They're like 20 slides long. Like, cool, I get to go home early. But that's pretty much it. <laughs> Does anyone have any question? Does anyone else have any question? If you don't want to talk, you can type in the chat. Um, I have a question. So um, I'm currently in high school and I saw that like y'all said to start taking classes like that you would take in pre-med like anatomy and physiology and stuff like that. Do y'all recommend doing anything else while we're in high school to get a study? I would pick up a second language. Um, like invest in yourself and uh, pick up Spanish or pick up Mandarin, um, because your patients are going to be culturally diverse. Um, and you cannot always rely on an interpreter being there. Uh, and so in order to provide the best possible care to your patient in the future, invest in yourself and pick up a language. Um, I'm going to say um, you should definitely, if you have the opportunity to try to shadow, just to see and Look at, look at, see what doctors do and see like what you want to do. And also they have summer programs for high schoolers as well. And that's going above and beyond because I wasn't doing any of that in high school, but they have some summer programs and uh, we'll try to get that to Carl. Maybe he can email it out to everybody, but I know Miss Ward is somebody who we all work pretty close with. She has, she's in charge of a summer program and there's it's so many different programs that you and miss. But if you're just really interested and you need to know right away, you can probably find them on the UAMS website, but we probably we try to get those opportunities out to y'all. Okay, thank you. And if you're shy, you can always ask us more questions in the breakout rooms. 
Okay, so if there is no more questions, we would be moving um, on to the pharmacy students. So over to you, pharmacy students. All right, can you all see the screen? Yes. Yes. Hey. So I'm Kennedy McElroy Charles again. I'm a P3 and I'm the current president of SNAFA. Um, similar to LMSA and SNMA, SNMA um, we primarily serve underserved um, patients in Arkansas. Um, we recently just went to um, the Delta region of Arkansas, which is really underserved. And we did a presentation similar to this and it was really helpful. We also served, um, we also served like homeless patients during Synergy Saturday and different things like that. So today we'll just be talking about pharmacy and how you get to become a pharmacist. Um, so just a quick outline, we're going to talk about how you can prepare in high school because it's never too early to start preparing, um, what you can do in college to prepare, what it's like um, in pharmacy school, and then what type of jobs you can get after graduation. Hi, my name is Kennedy Smith. I am a second year pharmacy student, and I'm going to talk about what a pharmacist is. So it's technically defined as a medication expert, but pharmacy itself is a blend of science, healthcare, and direct patient care. One thing that I really, really liked about pharmacy when I uh, was deciding that I wanted to pursue it is that patients typically see a pharmacist on a much more regular basis than they see any of their doctors. So, you know, you go into surgery a lot less then you may have to pick up, you know, your medications for high blood pressure or weight loss or, or anything. So um, like I said, we're medication experts and we go through lots of classes that teach us the chemical makeup of the drugs. We talk about how they're used. Um, we always have to know every adverse effect. Um, we have to know interactions between drugs because a lot of times patients uh, see different doctors. And so those doctors don't always get a chance to communicate with each other, but that patient might fill all their prescriptions at the same place every time. So as the pharmacist, it's your job to make sure that doctors that maybe weren't able to discuss haven't prescribed a patient medications that will interact negatively and make anything worse. You definitely don't want that. Um, some things that we do, we dispense medication. Um, that would be like the pharmacies that you see at a Walgreens and a CVS. We also counsel patients. So always make sure when you're picking something up that the pharmacist is offering to counsel you on what they just gave you, because a lot of times you may um, use it incorrectly or um, if the medication comes with a device, a lot of times patients need to be shown how to use those things like inhalers and stuff like that. Um, we communicate with healthcare providers to dispense medication properly. A lot of times we have to call the doctors um, because sometimes the patient may be allergic to what they gave them or maybe they just need a different dosage form. Maybe they're too afraid to inject themselves and they would like an oral medication or something liquid that they can drink. Um, we direct patients towards OTC medications. So a lot of times, maybe there's something over the counter that you can get without a prescription that could help your ailments as well. And lastly, we guide disease state management in healthcare settings. So um, a lot of what we learn that goes along with the medications is what diseases that they treat. So um, we just have to have a very balanced overall knowledge of the human body and what can go wrong with it because we're in charge of the medications that help them. All right, so I'll be talking about the different types of pharmacists. So a community pharmacist is what you usually see when you go to like Walgreens, Kroger, CVS, places like that. And then also at local independent pharmacies such as Cornerstone. 
Um, there also are hospital pharmacies, both um, inpatient and outpatient. So when you're in the hospital, all the medications you're receiving during your hospitalization come from an inpatient pharmacy. And then let's say you get discharged and you're picking up medications to take home. Those will come from the outpatient pharmacy. There are also administration roles such as pharmacy manager, pharmacy director, which direct all pharmacies in the hospital system. And then acute care pharmacists, um, they're more on the clinical aspect. So they're making um, rounds with doctors, giving different medication regimen um, updates and interaction checks and things like that. Um, nuclear pharmacists, I didn't know about this um, before pharmacy school. They actually prepare radioactive drugs. So let's say you're getting like an MRI or a CT scan or something and you need to be injected with um, something radioactive so the dye will show up on the MRI or CT scan. A pharmacist is actually um, the person who prepares that. Something interesting about this field of pharmacy is their hours are really weird. So nuclear pharmacists typically go into work between like 1 and 3 a.m. and they work until probably noon or 1 p.m. So they're working overnight shifts. Um, that's because the half-life of these drugs are so short and you have to make them really quickly in order for um, patients to get them on time. And so they're still active. Um, the next type of pharmacist is a clinical pharmacist. Um, these are also specialized types of pharmacists. So you have like cardiology, critical care, oncology, similar to um, medical doctors, but in the sense that we're only specializing in the drug. So let's say a patient has had a heart attack, a cardiologist pharmacist will go in and give the patient the specific medications that they're needing or make um, recommendations that the doctor should use one medication versus a different medication because a patient may be allergic to it or something like that. And those do require additional years of training. Um, next is government pharmacists. So they're pharmacists that work for the FDA, um, the CDC, the NIH. I'm honestly not 100% sure about what those pharmacists do there. I'm still learning about that, but um, that's something that you can go into and there's no patient care involved in that at all. So it's more like a public health type of thing. And then compound and pharmacists, that's a really cool um, field of pharmacy. Um, we make ointments, creams, suppositories. Let's say a patient can't take a pill or swallow a pill. We could um, crush that pill up and add some things and turn into an ointment so they can use that. Um, we can make dog treats. We've made horse treats in class, um, lollipops. There are so many different things that um, pharmacists can make um, drugs with, and it's a really cool field. So how do you know if pharmacy is right for you? Um, unlike um, the medical doctors, we don't have to commit as many years to becoming a pharmacist. So um, most people will get an undergrad degree, but now in pharmacy school, you only have to get your prerequisite um, classes completed. So that could be two to two and a half years and you don't have to finish college. You'll just go straight into pharmacy school after those two years. Um, pharmacy school itself is four years long, and after that, you can go straight into working as a pharmacist if you choose to, but if you do want to specialize in some of those jobs I mentioned earlier, then you'll do a residency or a fellowship um, of one or two years, which is completely optional, um, and you just get additional training. Um, the salary of a pharmacist is about $120,000 to $130,000 per year. And like I said, you can start making that directly out of pharmacy school. So you graduate in May, you start your job in June, you can be making $130,000 without any additional training. Um, how uh, much is school? So um, it really depends on which school you're going to. UAMS is relatively cheap compared to a lot of other schools. So for four years, it would be about $65,000 to $200,000 per year. Um, most people pay with school with their student loans, but there are also plenty of scholarships you can get, and some people just pay for it outright. And then what is the work-life balance of pharmacists? So 
Um, typically, most pharmacists work about 40 hours a week, um, like a nine to five. But if you're like in a retail setting, you might work 40 hours a week, but you would do maybe like a 10, I mean, a two to 10 p.m. shift. But you're not going to most of the time work overnight. There are some pharmacists in the inpatient settings that work overnight, but you can have a pretty balanced um, work life. and You're not going to be working 80 plus hours a week like maybe some medical doctors do, but that's why they get paid way <laughs> better than us. So now we're going to talk about how you can prepare um, for everything that is on the journey of becoming a pharmacist. So the main thing that anybody can do at any step is volunteering. Um, so in high school and college, you should try to get hands-on experience. It's really a good way to determine if the day-to-day -day and the ins and outs of what a pharmacist does is really for you. Um, I had my first internship my senior year of high school. Um, my school was downtown, so I walked to a pharmacy that was like a block away. And I mostly just was a cashier and I washed the dishes, but that is how I learned that pharmacists were able to compound. I didn't even know that they had dishes that needed to be washed. And so it was really cool, but I learned that they, retail pharmacists also have to stand a lot. And so if that is not for you, if you did an internship or if you volunteered or shadowed a pharmacist, um, which is actually very easy, I literally, walked up one day and I asked him, I told him I was interested in pharmacy school and he said I could come once a week and just help out. So you can do that. You should take um, AP classes while you are in high school. I knew I wanted to major in chemistry. So I made sure that I took AP chemistry just so that I had a really good um, introduction to it. Um, UAMS offers a pharmacy camp that high school students do. Um, it's a it's one or two days and you get to do a tour. We go really in depth in all of the different areas a pharmacist is able to work in. And we also let you guys compound about three or four different items um, like soap and chapstick and things like that. Um, and just making sure you're really involved in your classes and your community and just making sure that you're staying good on your grades. Um, like Quincy said earlier um, in the med school presentation, it's always good to learn how you study best because you're going to need to know that for any type of professional school that you enter into. In college, you can major in STEM, but you can also major in anything and go to pharmacy school as long as you take your prerequisites. Um, you can get your pharmacy tech license, I believe at the age of 18. Um, you can do lots of research projects. I've done those as well. I know a lot of the other students here for um, pharmacy they have as well. That's a good um, eye opener because a lot of pharmacists strictly do research, um, drug design and things like that. And then PCAP prep as well. Some colleges are leaning towards um, a more holistic approach um, in their admissions and they're looking at um, your GPA and volunteering and internships and research. And so you don't always have to take the PCAT, but it's one of the most standard ways to get in. So you definitely wanna get started on your PCAT prep um, months or even half a year to a year in advance of taking that. Hey guys, my name is Paloma. I'm a second year uh, pharmacy school student. So in pharmacy school itself, the first three years are strictly like classroom um, related, kind of like the first two years for the med students, um, except we go three years. Those are what they term your didactic years. In between those years, um, you'll have summer rotations. So for example, after our first year of pharmacy school, we go to an actual community pharmacy, kind of like Kennedy said, that'd be your Independence, Kroger, Walgreens, and you work there for three weeks. And the purpose of these rotations are to help give you experience and to what it's like to be a pharmacist in that kind of setting. Um, after your second year, you do a one month rotation at a hospital, and that's just to kind of give you input or insight into what it's like to be a pharmacist at a hospital. Now, your fourth year, there's no classes but you do rotations for about 10 months, if I'm correct, and you get to pick and choose um, 
what kind of rotations you want to focus more on. For example, there's students that know they want to do residencies, so they um, strictly do hospital rotations. Um, a really neat thing about doing rotations is that you do not have to stay in the state where you go to school. So I know at UAMS, we have a couple of students that every year actually do a rotation at a hospital in Italy. So they get to go to Italy and stay there for a month and do a rotation there. Now, you can also do internships during the summer. Um, it could be summer research, which at UAMS they offer, and you do get paid for a lot of those. Um, you get a neat little stipend. I think they kind of split it up how you get paid for that. Um, a couple of my friends have done a nuclear pharmacy internship. One of them is getting an all paid expenses to live in Denver for the summer to do a nuclear internship with a huge pharmaceutical company, and she'll be getting paid on top of that. So that's really neat. And then also a lot of people just cho choose to work. I mean, you could work in a hospital, you can work in a community pharmacy while you're in school and then during the summer to just kind of help you get some extra money because those loans run out real quick. <laughs> Hi, my name is Olga Roa Rodriguez, and I'll be talking about graduation. So after our four years of uh, pharmacy school, um, a lot of students go either directly into community pharmacies, which is what everyone thinks of pharmacists that help in like Kroger and retail parts of pharmacy, but there are also other parts. Similarly, kind of to like um, when doctors are doing their specialty, I think that's what you could consider a fellowship or residency. Um, Fellowship focuses a little bit more on like clinical aspects. So you can think about it more as like doing research, doing more social work. Um, and as the PowerPoint shows here, some examples are you could do research in infectious disease, focus on like nutrition and cardiology. And then residency is a little bit more if you're leaning towards working as a hospital pharmacist or um, if you just want a little bit more of hands-on experience in a hospital. It focuses more on clinical and like direct patient care experience. Most of it is uh, clinically based experiences. There are um, a few major differences between fellowships and res residencies. There are a lot more residencies than fellowships, which of course makes fellowships a little bit more competitive. That being said, if what you want to go into fellowship, you should definitely try um, getting into it. Um, I think the big picture that um, when you're trying to decide on which one to pick, if you want to get into these and not into retail pharmacy, is like where you see yourself in the future setting wise. Do you want to be in a hospital? Do you want to be more indirect or direct with your patients? Um, if you want to do more of a research aspect, then you probably want to go into fellowship. Once again, if you want to do more like hospital or hands on um, direct patient care, that'd be more residency wise. Um, another thing is the experiences that once again Paloma talked about during your rotations if you're leaning towards residency you probably want to do your rotations in a hospital setting and if you want to do a fellowship you probably want to do more of a clinical if possible research rotation So here's our contact information if you have questions later on, um, and then we'll take questions if you have them now as well. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. And once again, I got a lot from that presentation. So if we have questions, um, they're taking questions now, so. I just want to say that like pharmacists are amazing um, and it's always great to have them on your team because as like medical students, we do learn about medications, but it's not as like important to us. We just know like, hey, we should give an antibiotic, but pharmacists are really there to like say like, hey, we should give this one um, because they truly know like all the side effects and everything. So it's great to have them on every single team and I really appreciate them. So do we have any questions?
Okay, so if we have any questions that pop into our mind before um, the end of the five minute break that will be taken, we would have a little bit of time after the break to ask questions again. So um, we are taking a five minute break now just to um, digest every information that we have. And also if the panel needs to like go to the restroom or something, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 